antifungal regimens that are available for the treatment of oropharyngeal candidiasis include the azoles like clotrimazole, miconazole, and fluconazole, and the polyins, including nistatin. So the Okuntia monacantha, which was our plant of interest, is commonly known as prickly pear, and it belongs to the cactaceae family. It has been traditionally used, Opuntia monacantha plant, that is, in Elgeo Maraquet community for oral and oropharyngeal candidiasis, pancreatitis, blood cleansing, and diabetes. And underground honey is added to Opuntia monacantha for palatability because Opuntia monacantha extract is bitter. So the underground honey is obtained from stingless bees, which are found in holes around some tree in Elgeo Maraquet called Kipchom, and then it's mixed with the Opuntia monacantha, and Opuntia monacantha extract, and it's given to the baby to drink, or it's smeared around the mouth and the cheeks. So this research aimed to validate the claimed activity of Opuntia monacantha and underground honey, and found out their phytochemical compounds. As you can see, that is the Opuntia monacantha. It's the common cactus you know, the Opuntia monacantha plant and its flower. For the problem statement, oral thrush remains one of the most common fungal infection in infants and toddlers, where approximately five to seven percent of infants will develop oral thrush at some point in their lives. So if, it, if it's left untreated, it can be invasive and it's spread to other parts of the body, including the bones. So the other susceptible groups are the immunosuppressed groups, including the HIV and AIDS patients, and even the asthma patients who are on corticosteroid sprays, and even the cancer patients on chemotherapy. For our methodology, we used an experimental laboratory-based study design, and we, our study area was in Elgeo Maraquet County and in Kabarak University School of Pharmacy Laboratories. So from Elgeo Maraquet County, we did obtain our cladodes from the Opuntia monacantha and also the underground honey from the stingless bees. And then we did our material preparation and phytochemical screening in our pharmacognosy laboratories and antimicrobial activity testing, including MIC and zone of inhibition determination in our, mi in our microbiology labs. We used equipment, different equipment and microorganisms. We used three microorganisms, one fungus, which was Candida albicans, and two bacteria, one gram positive, which was Staphylococcus aureus, and one gram negative, which was Escherichia coli. And then we used Mullahinton agar and Sabaruth dextrose agar and nutrient broth agar. For the validity and reliability of our experiment and our equipment, first we, we prepared our culture media, sterilized and inoculated with different microorganisms to check its viability on whether it can support growth of microorganisms. And for results reliability, we did carry out the experiment in duplicates, including maybe for the for the antimicrobial susceptibility test of zone of inhibition determination, we ensured we carried out in, du in duplicates for the reliability of our results. So for the procedure, we obtained our samples from Elgeo Maraquet. First, we obtained our cladodes, whereby we chopped them into small pieces to reduce their succulency, because as you know, cactus is succulent, and we ensured we we obtained these samples during January because it was dry to, to at least get the cladodes which don't have a lot of water. We also obtained our underground honey, which as I told you, is from the stingless bees. These bees are commonly known as the mining bees and rena, yeah, because they don't sting. Yeah, and they are found in the, under some tree. Then we came to Kabarak, laboratories where we did microorganism test strain. We subcultured the test, the test strains and prepared our agar in the microbiology lab. Then we prepared our discs from the Watchman filter paper and inoculated our microorganisms on the sterile petri dishes. Then we proceeded to do antimicrobial susceptibility testing where we measured the zones of inhibitions that were exhibited by the different concentrations 
of the mixture of Opuntia monacantha and underground honey and for the Opuntia monacantha individually and underground honey individually. And then we determined our MIC through drought dilution. Finally, we did phytochemical screening in our pharmacognosy laboratories with the help of our lab technician where we determined the different phytochemical compounds that are present in Opuntia monacantha and also in the underground honey and we proceeded to compilation of our report. So for the results, as you can see, table one shows the growth of inhibition, that is for the antimicrobial susceptibility testing. It shows the, it shows the growth inhibition of the mixture of Opuntia monacantha and underground honey. And as I'm going to discuss in the discussion section, you will see as the concentration of the mixture decreased, the zone of inhibition decreased with the negative control producing no zone of inhibition. For our table two, for our table two, it's the growth inhibition that was produced by the extract of Opuntia monacantha individually. And same to this slide, as the concentration decreased, the zone of inhibition decreased and the negative control did not produce any inhibition on the microorganism used. For the table three, it's the growth inhibition of underground honey individually, and same as the other tables that I have projected. As the concentration decreased, the zone of inhibition decreased, there was no inhibition of the microorganisms that was seen on the negative control. Then our table four shows the phytochemical screening. We did the phytochemical screening of the underground honey separately and for the Opuntia monacantha cladode extract separately and I'm going to discuss what our outcome was whereby we tested for the presence of alkaloids, saponins, tannins, and even flavonoids. So for the discussion of the growth inhibition of the mixture of Opuntia monacantha and underground honey, so we tested the mixture for the in vitro antifungal and antibacterial activity and the mixture demonstrated both the antifungal and antibacterial activity. The highest activity for the mixture was obtained against Escherichia coli, where zone of inhibition of 7.51 mm was obtained, while the, after the E. coli, the best activity was seen in Candida albicans with a zone of inhibition of 7.46, and finally Staphylococcus aureus of 6.29. So the mixture, as we are going to see in the subsequent slides, you will note that the mixture of Opuntia monacantha, cladode extract, and underground honey exhibited higher activity than when we tested for Opuntia monacantha and underground honey individually. So the positive controls that we used for the, against the Candida albicans, we used fluconazole, which produced a zone of inhibition of 9.400 mm. And against our bacteria, we used gentamicin, which produced a zone of inhibition of 22.71 and 22.40 against E. coli and S. aureus, respectively. I don't know what happened. Sorry for that. So for the, sorry. So for the negative control, there was no zone of inhibition that was exhibited. We did analyze our data using ANOVA analysis of variance, and we found our p-value to be 0 0.014, meaning the data is statistically significant in that it's below the standard, which is 0 0.05, meaning the different zone of inhibitions for the mixture of Opuntia monacantha and underground honey were different from each other, meaning the concentrations that were used affects efficacy. For the discussion of the growth inhibition of Opuntia monacantha cladode extract individually, we also tested for, their, for its in vitro antibacterial and antifungal activity, and the extract also demonstrated activity against the three microorganisms, but not as, not as high as, that, as the activity that was seen in the mixture. So the highest activity in this case was seen in Candida albicans, which exhibited, in which the extract exhibited a zone of inhibition of 7.31, then followed by E. coli of 7.18 zone of inhibition, and finally staph aureus of 6.29.
So our positive controls in this case were fluconazole for the, against the candida albicans, and it exhibited a zone of inhibition of 9.40. And for our positive control against the bacteria, the gram-negative and gram-positive, we used gentamicin, which exhibited a zone of inhibition of 22.71 against Escherichia coli and 22.40 against S. aureus. So for our negative control, there was the zone of inhibition was 4.00 mm. And the same case, we did analyze our data for the growth inhibition of the extract of Opuntia monacantha, and our p-value was 0 0.012, meaning the data was statistically significant in that the different zones of inhibition did differ from one another. For the discussion of the growth inhibition of underground honey, the under, we also tested underground honey for its activity against the three microorganisms, Candida albicans, Escherichia coli, and S. aureus, and the highest activity was seen in, against Escherichia coli, which, in which the underground honey exhibited a zone of inhibition of 6.47, followed by Candida albicans, with a zone of inhibition of 6.46, and finally, S. aureus with a zone of inhibition of 5.70. So for our positive controls, the fluconazole against candida albicans produced a zone of inhibition of 9.40, while the gentamicin produced a zone of inhibition of 22.71 and 22.40 against E. coli and S. aureus, respectively. For our negative control, the zone of inhibition was 4.00 millimeters. We analyzed our data using ANOVA analysis of variance, and our p-value was 0 0.09, meaning the data was statistically significant, which means the different, the different zones of inhibitions did, did differ from one another. For the phytochemical screening, Sorry. For the phytochemical screening, so Opuntia monacantha was positive for, so we did the phytochemical screening for Opuntia monacantha extract alone and for the underground honey alone. So for the Opuntia monacantha extract, it was positive for the alkaloids, saponins, flavonoids, and tannins, whereby a very high concentration of alkaloid was present with moderate levels of flavonoids and traces of saponins and tannins. On the other hand, honey was positive for moderate levels of alkaloids, traces of tannins, and saponins. It was, however, negative for the flavonoids. So we can attribute the antifungal and antibacterial activity to the phytochemical, since we know the polyphenols, including the flavonoids and tannins, have antimicrobial activity. In conclusion, Opuntia monacantha cladod extract and underground honey have demonstrated significant antifungal and antibacterial activity. Thus, natural resources still have a lot of untapped potential as sources of new medicine. Due to the high cost and higher risk of side effects in conventional drugs for oral candidiasis in children, Opuntia monacantha and underground honey can be used as alternative therapies. I therefore recommend extraction using different solvents to obtain varied plant constituents from the Opuntia monacantha and also further characterization of the plant extract and the underground honey constituents using techniques such as chromatography and microbiological studies to identify any other active constituents that might be responsible for activity. I also recommend pharmacological studies to be done in laboratory animals and formulation studies also should be done prior to the commercialization of the mixture of Opuntia monacantha cladod extract and underground honey against oral thrush. Thank you. Uh, 
a better round of applause for Elizabeth. Yes. If you have any questions, kindly jot them down. We'll have them answered after we are done with our presentation. So our next presenter, uh, I know you know him well, Dr. Titus Sugya, the Dean School of Pharmacy. Uh, Dr. Sugya is a senior lecturer in clinical pharmacology with over 12 years experience in university teaching and quality assurance. His research interests include clinical pharmacology, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, epidemiology, communicable diseases, antimicrobial resistance, and quality management systems. His presentation is on steroid utilization and resistance in diuriagic E. coli isolates from children under five years within Nakuru County. Let us welcome Dr. Titus Suge. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, Mika, Wairimu, can you hear me? Thank you. I don't know if I'm going to display uh, from my side or the display is coming from the side. Uh, well, as they said, uh, I think uh, my topic is on steroid utilization and resistance in diagenic escherichia coli isolated from children under five years old uh, here in Nakuru County. Um, I wish to say that the previous speaker. Uh, talked about uh, antimicrobial resistance, which we are finding it. Um, uh, it's become it's going to become the next pandemic, or it's already picking up. Um, and so it's an area that uh, if we don't look at the regulations and the policies, um, then we can we are doomed to struggle with management of these resistance. I picked E. coli, it's a common bug uh, that you find across the board. I picked the medications that we frequently use in terms of corticosteroids and, uh, and uh, we wanted to just look at the correlation of the corticosteroid use, usage with creating the challenge that we are having. Okay, thank you, Mika. I can see the screen. However, you can put it in a display mode. So, will it be okay if I share my screen, Mika? Okay. okay. Thank you. That's fine, that's fine. So I'll start with slide, we'll go to slide one. I'm sorry I'm presenting this from the online platform. And so we find that resistance to first line antibiotics uh, become a threat. And this one, we look at amoxicillin, ampicillin, uh, the cell wall inhibitors, and um, the beta-lactam. Uh, which we normally use for first line treatment. And um, I wish to echo what my colleagues have talked about. And um, in the morning, uh, uh, one of the speakers mentioned about One Health coming in together so that we can understand um, uh, the usage of these like, uh, 
uh, medications in terms of from the human perspective to the animal. I don't know if you can hear me. I need to have somebody to signal me so that I'm on the floor quicker. Yes, we can Hello. hear you. Thank you, thank you. So you can press the next slide because um, um, I'm still on the first slide. Monica, are we on the second slide? Doc, we, we are in the third slide, second slide. Yeah, my screen is still displaying the, the second slide, the first slide, the title. So should I be given a chance to share from my side? Yes, you can. Is it visible now? Yes, yes. yes. Are we okay there? Uh, you can show, you can tell me if I'm on that slide, the first slide. Hello? Yes, Doc, you can continue to the next slide. It's oh, in so, on the introduction. So we're in the introduction right now. Thank you. So, um, as commented by one of the keynote speakers, uh, Fred, he talked about One Health, and uh, you realize that children are those who are really affected. And among uh, the E. coli bugs, the pathotypes, uh, we looked at the EHEC, EPEC, EPEC, and then um, you also realize that apart from these common bug coming in, there are some comorbidities that we are finding with the with this pediatric, like uh, hypertension, HIV, asthma, obesity, and um, quite a lot of uh, uh, studies have shown that um, they impair the immunity, and that is what uh, led us to looking at this. And so, uh, the extent to which the corticosteroid are used. Um, and how they are resulting in antibiotic resistance uh, is not well documented. Um, but we all know or understand that the corticosteroids would normally lower from the pharmacological point of view, would always lower the immunity, uh, which when we look at first line management of uh, bacteria, uh, they would, they, they, the mechanism has always been known to, to just manage uh, uh, to be bacteriostatic so that uh, your body's immunity can take over from there. So, so as far as we are aware, we don't have much of this being established here in Kenya, such studies. And then um, we all understand from our background of practice that the use of this corticosteroid is quite on a higher side. Um, so this study uh, tries to establish the relationship between now the usage of this corticosteroid and 
uh, antimicrobial resist resistance with regards to the death prototype, that is the disease post um, uh, prototypes of E. coli. And uh, the need to curb the rise in cases of the AMR, and thus the mortalities among children under five. Um, this study was done in a cosmopolitan uh, setting so that we can have a simulation of an ideal environment. And we did explore uh, also the corticosteroids, like uh, who, uh, uh, the scope were limited to the dexamethasone. Uh, um, and so the objective of this study was to explore corticosteroid utilization and resistant patterns among death patients isolated from children under the age of five in Africa. And so the study design was a case control whereby we had 1,124 children presenting with diarrhea. Um, out of this, uh, we picked uh, those with positive death, which were 384. Out of these 384, we, through our inclusion exclusion criteria, um, we were able to get 192 cases. And the case definition was noted as those who were resistant to amoxicillin, which is normally the first line treatment. Um, children ages zero to 60 were used, uh, were, uh, were the ones who were participating. And so the sample collection and analysis, this was taken through the lab, where we were trying to determine the resistance and the susceptibility. And we use an array of drugs, um, but our drug that we used as a definition of case was amoxicillin. Our molecular work was done through PCR uh, to characterize and to know the prototypes. We went ahead to also identify the, the gene, resistant gene that we were looking at. And so reliability and validity of the instrument was done. And statistical analysis, as you can see, we used the odds ratio, uh, chi square, and um, and so we I'll share the presentation in form of the tables. Uh, and so the results, uh, we were able to to um, pick the four prototypes: EEC, ETEC, ETEC, and EEC. And uh, the drugs that we were looking in terms of, of resistance were ampicillin, azithromycin, and lidic acid and cefoxid. And then um, you can look at uh, the p value, it tells us the chi square, those that were seen to have some form of association was ampicillin, azithromycin, and then um, the lidic acid. Um, when we look at the frequencies, in terms of the utilization of uh, corticosteroids by both the cases and the controls, we noted that um, out of the 384, um, those that met the criteria, um, in terms of having allergic reaction, we had a high percentage. We also had a high percentage of those with allergic reaction and the uh, and frequently experiencing it. And uh, in terms of the medication use, corticosteroid and antihistamine were quite high. Um, and when we went further to look at what steroidal corticosteroid drug being used, um, we realized that dexamethasone and methylphenidone was highly utilized. Um, we went further to categorize in terms of cases and the uh, and, uh, controls. Um, remember, the controls were those that were positive uh, with DEC, but they were not having any resistance from oxygen. And so when we looked at the odds ratio, um, we realized that the odds of having a child with allergic reaction was actually around three times. Um, we also realized for the 
children who rarely had that uh, allergic reaction or asthma, or they never experienced it, they would rarely experience, had a protective, um, was protective against, you know, resistance. Uh, for allergic reaction, um, for those who use corticosteroids, there were around three times more uh, chances of having antimicrobial resistance. While the use of antihistamine seemed to be protective against uh, resistance. And um, you can even see the type of corticosteroid dexamethasone and prednisone uh, really showed high, uh, greater chances of uh, antimicrobial resistance. And so, in summary, um, we found a significant association between resistance across the antibiotics uh, and the pathotypes was observed except for uh, cefoxifen, which is uh, a cephalosporin. And then um, the, the children who are having allergic reaction to asthma uh, with subsequent usage of dexamethasone. And there was a correlation between this reaction with corticosteroid medication, especially dexamethasone, with around nine. A blessing to note that uh, use of antihistamine was conferring a protection against uh, the antimicrobial resistance. Um, in terms of the discussion, um, uh, the association between this AMR and antibiotic utilization um, is, has been always known, and especially in first line. I think we have lost the first line treatment, and now we can see it penetrating to the second line. Um, we know extensively that the prevalence of first line resistance strains uh, is there, and there is a prospective steady rise uh, of cases of this resistance to other uh, uh, lines, like the micro macro lines, and now the cephalosporins, first generation, second generation. And now the fear is now coming in even with the fifth generation that is now out. And then the, the, the worrying bit is the subsequent usage of high corticosteroid. Uh, there is so much prevalence of that usage. Um, and dexamethasone being the commonly used corticosteroid indicated for allergic reaction. Uh, children under the age of five, have been noted to be susceptible to some of these conditions like allergic reactions or asthma or other inflammatory conditions. And that's why they're becoming vulnerable for the usage of these amethysts. And therefore, um, we have also this that several studies have shown that the use of this is directly associated with immune system impairment. And probably the first line now not picking up. Um, we also observed that antihistamine usage conferred a protective effect against this MR. And probably this could be due to the blocking of the production of histamine uh, that have inherent capabilities of actually disrupting the bacterial pathways, uh, thus disrupting existence uh, within uh, a host organism. In conclusion, um, steady rise uh, in the cases of antimicrobial resistance um, in first line and now extending um, to second line medication. And therefore, the ever rising cases of allergic reaction being seen among children under five uh, has led to subsequent usage of corticosteroids, especially for dexamethasone. And this could be the reason why we are having antimicrobial resistance. Uh, probably this, we can augment the use of this corticosteroid with antihistamines so that uh, we end up having that protective uh, nature. Our recommendation, we need more information on the utilization of corticosteroids in the management of allergic disorders. Uh, we also propose proper utilization of antibiotics in combination with antihistamine and corticosteroids and so that we can uh, put these into our protocols. If we have antihistamine to replace corticosteroids, especially for asthma, 
uh, or the allergic reaction from the better. Um, so, but we end up taking care of the guidelines, uh, the implementation or mutualization of these corticosteroids uh, to, 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 to lower the resistance. Thank you so much. These are my references. Back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sunge. Another round of applause for him. <laughs> yes, as he has rightfully said, AMR is the next global pandemic, and we need to do as much as possible to be stewards of the drugs that we have at the moment. So our next presenter is uh, Felix Otieno. He is an alumni of Kabarak University School of Pharmacy. Almost an alumni. Uh, he's a research enthusiast, having about 14, 14 publications in several peer-reviewed journals. Um, his current research interest is in the field of bioinformatics. His presentation today is uh, on computational analysis of compounds similar to ellagic acid, chimferol, and mangiferin with inhibitory activity towards aldose reductase enzyme. Let us welcome Philip. Thank you very much, Doc. Uh, my name is Felix Otieno, and on behalf of uh, the authors I'll be presenting, uh, a study on virtual screening for chemical analogs, similar to phytochemicals that uh, inhibit aldose reductase in the development of diabetic microvascular complications. Uh, diabetes mellitus, as you all know, is the ninth leading cause of death globally, currently, and is the major reason for the increase in male deaths since the year 2019. This is based on, w, uh, on World, World Health Organization. It is a chronic disease that, uh, once diagnosed with, has a very poor recovery pro prognosis. Uh, mostly you end up spending almost the rest of your life on medication. Uh, its chronic form is associated with development of medical emergencies, as you all know, progressive microvascular and macrovascular complications. Uh, and also, the several pathways, including the sorbitol pathway, leads to these complications. 
So for this uh, research uh, study, the major focus was on the sorbitol pathway. Uh, pathological hallmark in diabetes complication, diabetic complication usually encompasses the vasculature. That's why we're talking about microvascular and macrovascular complication. And we know microvascular complications, uh, mi microvascular, mi microvessels function uh, to control blood pressure, control, control permeability, and optimize blood flow to the tissues. While the macrovascular complications, the arteries and the veins, uh, usually predominantly function as transport medium. In diabetic patients, the excess glucose now, since the body, the cells, the tissues in the body is not util utilizing glucose, leads to uh, hyper hyperglycemia, which causes thickening of the capillary basement. This has actually been, been shown and increased protein synthesis within the extracellular matrix of microvascular. That's the small vessels, the arterioles and the venules and the capillaries. So this, all these changes in some total together with uh, edges is advanced glycated end products, which uh, usually results from conjugation of glucose and proteins in the body. Uh, and inflammation induces micro, microangiopathy, which enables development of microvascular complication. So just, that's just generally the background for how diabetes and complications related to diabetes tend to occur. On to our main focus for this study, we are looking at the sorbitol pathway responsible majorly for the microvascular complications. The microvascular complications are retinopathy, neuropathy, and uh, retinopathy, neuropathy, there is a third one. So aldose reductase is an unspecific en enzyme catalyzing conversion of any sugar into its alcohol form within the body. In healthy individuals, this enzyme, aldose reductase, has a very low affinity for glucose in the body. So predominant, predominantly, it will not be active. It will be, uh, it will be inactive. But in hyperglycemic condition, the affinity for glucose by this enzyme increases. So predominantly, much of the glucose that is not utilized by cells uh, gets acted upon by aldose reductase. The enzyme is found highly localized in special, specific cells, such as the epithelia of the lenses, papilla and uh, cortical uh, cells in kidney, strand cells in peripheral nerves, and islets of longer hands. And as you can see, this corresponds to the various microvascular complications that we have. For example, epithelia of the lenses, uh, there we are going to have retinopathy, papilla and cortical cells of the kidney, we are going to have nephropathy, and the strand cells uh, in peripheral nerves, we are going to have nephropathy, yeah, no, neuropathy. Currently, near, nearly 600 plant species have been shown to have anti-diabetic properties, majorly from ethnobotanical studies based on literature review. And extract from some of these plants are phytochemical compounds, well known, that influence the glucose metabolic pathways, leading to uh, development, the pathways that lead to development of, micro, of diabetic complication. So specific phytochemicals such as flav flavanols, specifically quercetin, mangiferin, luteolin, have been shown to be potent aldose reductase inhibitors, which is a, a useful thing. So as such, this study aimed at analyzing analogs of specific flavonoids that delay onset of microvascular conditions with better pharmacokinetic and toxicology profile using computational methods. So this is the two-step pathway of the sorbitol. It's called sorbitol or polyol pathway. So first, glucose is converted to sorbitol, sorbitol which is an intermediate product, then is converted to fructose. The first reaction is a rate limiting step. So once glucose is converted to sorbitol, uh, we don't have a reverse process per se. 
the intermediate, uh, so in equilibrium conditions, the forward reactions are favored, leading to fructose and sorbitol accumulating in the intracellular component of the cell, yet they are osmotically active. So by them being osmotically active, that is fructose and sorbitol, they tend to accumulate within the cells of the various organs you have talked about, the papilla, the Schwann cells, the uh, epithelia of the lensens. And being osmotically active, they lead to swelling, which results in the complications of diabetes. So in this study, we are looking at what are some of the uh, phytochemicals, the analogs which can be de developed into drugs to be used in diabetic complications. So methodology, we employed an in silico study design using computational methods. Literature review was used to identify these plants, as you have seen. And then we had to validate the claims made from literature review, and we did that using sister gate prediction. Three phytochemicals were chosen for analysis, lagic acid, chimferon, and mangiferin. Sulindac, which is a drug, is our comparator or, or our standard, uh, based on the fact that it's an approved aldose reductase inhibitor. Structure and canonical smiles of the three phytochemicals were obtained from PubCare. The canonical smiles were used to screen online database. Specifically, zinc database was used for this research. So for each of the three phytochemicals, we had 20 analogs uh, with the highest similarity index to the parent phytochemical, except for allergic. Allergic only gave us four, and we used all of them. So autodoc vena was used to dock selected uh, phytochemicals and the analogs. Then the interaction between the ligands and the enzymes were visualized using Discovery, BioVia Bio Discovery Studio is a software app. The pharmacokinetic profile of the various analogs was predicted using Swiss Adme, while the toxicological prediction was done using Protox Server. On the results, as you can see now, we have the Solindac, we have the Logic Acid, the structures, Mangiferin and Chimferol. We can see the Solindac, we have the, uh, the Aldous reductase on your bottom right. Those are the, that's the structure of Aldous reductase. From Swiss target prediction, we had allergic uh, acid, chimferon, and mangiferin. Had 100% probability of binding to this enzyme. So we validated the claims from the literature review. Uh, these were interactions. This is the active pocket. In the background is the active pocket of Aldous reductase. And the various structures are the phytochemicals written above. And the second row represents the best analog for each phytochemical. So as you can see, for allergic acid, they were not per se fitting in the active site compared to chimferol. Uh, both the, uh, and also mangiferin was too large to fit within the active site. That uh, represents the uh, interactions, the bonds resulting between the structure, the, chemical, the phytochemical, and the receptor. That's the enzyme. So majorly, as you can see, most of the interactions were either hydrophobic or uh, ionic in terms of hydrogen bonding. Uh, this one, uh, yeah, I hope you can see. This one represents the pharmacokinetic and toxicological results of the various phytochemicals. I'm going to go through all of them, just a few. So under discussion, structura structurally, we are, uh, it's required that for a drug that targets the receptor, aldose reductase active sites, you need to have a primary lipo lipophilic moiety, which can be an aromatic ring, and a thiocarbonyl or carbonyl group that is located 2.8 to 3.8 Armstrong. So Sulindac, acetyl salicylic acid conform to this structure, that's why they are binding and they're active. And the other structures, quercetin, allergic acid, mangiferin, also conform to this structure. So that's why we are using them. So in terms of docking, chimferol, which was one of the phytochemical, had the strongest binding affinity as you compare to, compare to allergic acid and mangiferin. Uh, uh, and uh, as we saw, 
the chiamphenol and the analog fit very well in the binding pocket. That's why they had a very good binding affinity. Uh, allergic acid is more planar and rigid, so it tended to be on the outside or uh, the, on the outer hydrophobic surface, while mangiferin was sludge. And then among the zinc, uh, uh, to note, Sulindac, which was our comparator, had a binding score of negative 9.6. So the more the negative, the more the stronger their binding affinity. So generally, what we had is the compounds and the phytochemicals. Yes, they, they bind it, they bind it to the receptor, the enzyme, but the affinity was lower compared to our comparator. So we sort of looked at the pharmacokinetic and toxicological profile. Because conventionally, we cannot use Sulindac for this uh, purpose because you're going to need a higher dose than the recommended one. So among the zinc compounds reassembled, uh, uh, ellagic acid, two compounds exhibited slightly stronger affinity compared to the phytochemical. For chiamphenol, you have 14 out of the 20 had a stronger affinity, while for mangiferin, we had 12. So clearly, chiamphenol and its analog displayed a uh, highest binding affinity compared to analogs of both ellagic acid and mangiferin. In terms of pharmacokinetic analysis, all three phytochemicals were substrate for pig glycoprotein, so there might be uh, uh, issues with the amount of bioavailability. They did not penetrate the blood-brain barrier, so there's minimal CNSI defects predicted. And then they did not inhibit CYP uh, cytochrome enzyme 2C19 and 2C9. So both ellagic acid and chiamphenol demonstrated high, pre high gastrointestinal absorption and inhibited swip so one a 2 So there's potential drug-drug interactions compared to uh, mangiferin. Mangiferin, on the other side, had a low GI absorption, so not very good for oral absorption, and did not inhibit any cytochrome enzymes but it did violate two of the Lempinski rules uh, due to the uh, presence of specific atoms. Specifically, it was uh, nitrogen and oxygen. Pharmacokinetic analysis so of the zinc analogs was similar to the parent phytochemical, while for chiamphenol, most, uh, most of them were similar to uh, the parent compound, uh, with ex uh, except a few uh, yeah, of the analogs. For mangiferin, the zinc analog displayed low GI absorption as the parent compound and did not penetrate blood-brain barrier and also did not inhibit CIP, the various CYP enzymes. So although mang a mangiferin analog had reduced enzyme interactions, most of them exhibited low predicted GI absorption, so not good for oral absorption, for oral formulation. Conversely, while analogs of chiamphenol had strong binding affinity, it was predicted to inhibit at least three cytochrome P450 enzymes, so potential drug-drug uh, interaction. So in general, in terms of pharmacokinetic, uh, analogs of ellagic acid demonstrated a favorable profile with no Lempinski rule violation, high GI absorption, and inhibition of very few CYP, uh, CYP enzymes. In terms of toxicology, chiamphenol exhibited a higher safety profile compared to allergic acid and mangiferin. As you can see with the LD50 values, uh, mangiferin demonstrated significant toxicity. So the LD value was as low as two milligrams per kilogram. That's very toxic. So unsuitable for formulation. In terms of analogs, chiamphenol were predicted to activate specific pathways. So majorly this was prediction in terms of do they activate specific nuclear and uh, cytotoxic, cytotoxic pathways, which can lead to cytotoxic effect once given? So chiamphenol were predicted to activate specific pathways. Uh, so caution should be ex ex exercised regarding further development of such analogs. Conversely, allergic acid analogs demonstrated chemical safety, absence of mutagenicity, mm -hmm. hepatotoxicity, and cytotoxicity. Among chiamphenol analogs, a subset were potentially carcinogenic and mutagenic. For mangiferin analogs, uh, except for a few, most did not activate specific pathways, nor did they demonstrate hepatotoxicity or cytotoxicity. 
but they were toxic based on their LD values. So in conclusion, Camferol and some of its zinc analogs had strongest binding affinity compared to elagic acid, mangiferin, and the analogs. Elagic acid, mangiferin, and the zinc analogs, uh, Camferol and some of its zinc analogs had docking score lower than that of Solindac. So meaning the, the affinity was slightly comparable. Analogs of elagic acid showed better pharmacokinetic profile, and uh, unlike analogs of kyanferol and mangiferin. So most, if not all, analogs of the three phytochemicals are predicted to be potentially toxic, but in mild to moderate severity. So in overall analogs, the ones given there, for kyanferol, elagic acid, and mangiferin, respectively, they depicted best optimal characteristics required for further development. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Felix. Um, bioinformatics offers a new area in which we can find new drugs for management of our patients, particularly with diabetes mellitus. So our next presentation, I hope you're writing down your questions. We will take them at the end. Our next presentation uh, is by Simon Washira. Simon Washira is a final year pharmacy student um, awaiting graduation in December 2023. He is passionate about leadership and has been a student leader at Kabarak University for two terms, having served as Secretary General Kuso 2022-2021. He's also an entrepreneur in the field of fashion design, having founded his own company, Washira's Design. He is interested in pursuing clinical pharmacy as an area of practice and later uh, to join politics. So his presentation will be on the factors associated with seroconversion in HIV exposed infants in a Nakuru a County Teaching and Referral Hospital between 2019 and 2020. Please welcome Simon Washira. Uh, good afternoon. I hope you can see me over there. <laughs> All right, I'm Simon Washira, uh, waiting graduation this coming uh, December. Uh, we did this project as our undergraduate project uh, with my colleagues, that is uh, Hopkins Nyaribo and Babon Wendo, and our supervisor was Dr. Kelvin Manyega. So we are going to I'm going to present on this, um, this presentation on the factors influencing the level of seroconversion in HIV exposed infants at Nakuru County and Teaching Referral Hospital between uh, 2019 and 2020. On to our background, approximately that 7.7 .7 million people were living with HIV globally in 2020, and 55% of these were inhabitants of Eastern and Southern Africa. Two-thirds of these accounted for the infected children living in this region. Kenya had a prevalence of 5.6%. That translates to 1.4 million. Uh, and, and in 2020, there were 5,200 new infection of children, which was a decrease from 6,200 in 2015. That is according to UNAIDS. Uh, according to Kenfia 2018, Kenya was ranked the fifth in the world 
with the highest number of people living with HIV and AIDS, and with Nakuru having a prevalence of 3%. Kenya Adopting Prevention of Mother to Child uh, program, that is PMTCT program, in 2002, uh, that's according to Abere, et al, 2018, which was being implemented in over 5,000 health facilities in Kenya. Uh, Kenya has managed to achieve 94% coverage by 2020 of PMTCT services countrywide. And according to UNAIDS 2021, the rate of vertical transmission in a vertical transmission in 2020 was at 9.7%, down from 19.7% in 2010. Uh, the, ART, the ART prophylaxis targets on destroying and preserving the immunity and preventing, preventing vertical transmission by suppressing the virus. Uh, the preferred first regimen in women of childbearing age, uh, we have tenofovil, lamivudine, and efavirenz. Uh, but that was uh, that was uh, in 2018, according to NASCOP, but it was later substituted with uh, dutegravil due to the safety issues with the efavirenz. Uh, the HIV-exposed infants are initiated on zidovudine twice day and, uh, FRV, uh, and uh, nevirapine once day, uh, which, it's, which is continued until six weeks after breastfeeding. And then the contrimoxazole preventive therapy is introduced at the seventh week and is used still there six weeks after cessation of breastfeeding. Uh, under our problem statement, uh, HIV-exposed infants can turn out to be negative when prevention of mother-to-child transmission our intervention are followed effectively. In 2020, there were 33,000 new HIV infections, which, of which approximately 5,200 were, children, were children between 0 to 14 years. This according to UN AIDS 2021. The Kenya AIDS Strategic Framework 2 2020 focuses in reducing new HIV infection by 75%, which includes minimizing MTCT of HIV. Despite the efforts to minimize mother-to-child transmission of HIV, HIV seroconversion still occurs. This research aims to understand the level of seroconversion among HIV-exposed infants and the factors that contribute to HIV transmission among these HIV-exposed infants, and also to, it will help in identifying necessary reinforcements needed to prevent mother-to-child transmission of HIV. Under the justification of the study, uh, these findings will help uh, the Ministry of Health and other policymakers to identify gaps contributing to seroconversion in infants and thus formulate policies to enhance PMTC services. Uh, it will also help the healthcare professionals in Nakuru County and Teaching Referral Hospital to offer health education with a review to reduce mother to child transmission of HIV uh, infections. Then it also helped the donors, policymakers, and other stakeholders access progress towards national targets in preventing uh, mother-to-child transmission of HIV, that is elimination of HIV, new infection among, inf among children by 2030. And that's according to UN UNAIDS 2011. And objectives, the main objective is to determine the level of seroconversion among HIV-exposed infants at Nakuru County Teaching and Referral Hospital. And the second, the, and a specific objective is to determine the prevalence of HIV infection among HIV-exposed infants. And then the sec, uh, to, other, to the second ob specific objective is to determine the occurrence of factors associated with seroconversion um, pre present in a sample of patients from Nakuru County Teaching and Referral Hospital and to determine the independent predictors of seroconversion at Nakuru County and Teaching Referral Hospital using multivariable regression modeling. And the conceptual framework, uh, HIV seroconversion is the dependent variable here, and the other factors such as clinical factors, maternal factors, um, child factors, and obstetric factors, they are the independent variables. Under the methodology, the study design is, the is a retrospective cohort study. Uh, the subject pro population is the HIV exposed infants, setting Nakuru County Teaching and Referral Hospital. Um, the sample size determ determination, uh, we use the Cochrane formula, uh, which is highlighted over there. Uh, using the formula, we're able to get uh, the population or sample population, which was 139, mother and child pairs. Uh, the sampling procedure, we did a simple random sampling. And the data collection procedure, development of a data collection tool, uh, retrieval of data from the database, entry and simple analysis. A research method and instruments is review of electronic ART and MCH data. Under validity and reliability of research instruments, electronic records contain demographic, vital statistics, claims, clinical and patient set and data, enable study of exposure disease over a period of time. This collection tool was reviewed by our supervisor. 
uh, under data analysis procedure, we upload to, CF, to SPSSS to check for inconsist inconsistencies and incompleteness of data, then sum summarize using descriptive statistics and also inferential statistics. Data analysis, we did um, descriptive statistics and uh, regression statist statistics, that is bivariate and multivariate logistic regression, uh, data presentation, uh, textual, table, and graphs. Uh, under the results, um, in the demographics, uh, distribution of measures of central ten tendency for the mothers and HIV exposed infants ages. So, uh, for the for the child age, that was the age at enrollment, uh, the mean was 6.36 weeks and the mode and median was 6 at a standard deviation of 1.69. And mother's age, most uh, the mean was 35.88, uh, the mode was 34, median 36 at standard deviation of 5.92. Uh, our population, um, the male, the infant sex distribution, male accounted for the 49%, 49 and uh, of course female 51%. And then, and our first objective in the results, uh, the prevalence of HIV among HIV exposed infants below two years. Um, at six weeks, the prevalence was 5%. At six months, at testing now, it was 4.3%, which remained until the 24 months, that is two years. Then, under the second objective, um, under the factors now, the ART status of mothers whose HIV exposed infants, infants were analyzed, 95.8% of mothers were on heart, and 2.1% um, were not on heart. The rest you can see over the figures there. Then under ART, that is ART prophylaxis given to the HIV-exposed infants, 96.5% uh, were on ART prophylaxis, whereas 3.5% were not on ART prophylaxis. Then under the HIV-exposed prophylaxis refill, at six weeks, uh, we can see over around 95% of infants uh, were on contramoxazole and nevirapine, which decreased over the period, like, as we've seen in 24 months. Most of the infants had already stopped the prophylaxis, so it reduces with the, as the age proceeded. And then the mode of infant feeding, uh, around 95% at six weeks were exclusive breastfed, and mixed breastfed, were, it was around uh, 2% at the six weeks, and then uh, the breastfeeding decreases, uh, decreased down uh, with the progression of the age. And then at the entry point of HIV exposed infants into the record system, 95.8% uh, of the HIV exposed infants were enrolled at the MCH, and then 1.4% uh, at CCC, maternity 0.7%, uh, outpatient uh, there was none, and uh, in patient there was 2.1 percent. Then, uh, after we after we observed those factors, uh, we did a bivariate analysis to check on the association between seroconversion, uh, the variables, uh, the independent variables, which is in this case we have the maternal ART, the infant ART, exclusive breastfeeding at six months, and the entry point. These are the these are the independent predictors. We did. Uh, Bivariate analysis using the chi-square, and uh, all the all these variables were found to be statistically significant with a p-value less than 0.05. Uh, for the maternal ART, uh, for those infant in whose mothers were, were not on uh, on ART, they were 44 times likely to seroconvert compared to those whose mothers were already on ART. The, the infants who are not uh, insisted on ART prophylaxis, they were 65.5% times likely to seroconvert compared to infants who were already insisted on ART prophylaxis. Then exclusive breastfeeding at six months, uh, infants who are likely to, it was, it was um, protective because uh, the OST ratio was less than one, and the, that means the infants who are exclusive breastfeed at six months, they were 0 0.036, but 0.036 times likely to circumvert. And the entry point uh, for those infants who are enrolled in other areas other than MCH, they are 44 times likely to circumvert. Then we went ahead and carried a multivariate analysis to check on the, to get the independent predictor of seroconversion. And uh, under maternal ART, 
uh, the p-value was above 0 0.05, 0 .0, I was above 0 0.05, and then the exclusive breastfeeding at six months, it was less than 0 0.05, thus it was statistically significant. The entry point, it was above 0 0.05. Under the conclusion and recommendation, um, majority of HIV positive mothers were at their prime age with a mean age of 35.9 years. Most of the HIV exposed infants were females and their information required for the health record keeping were mostly taken from, M from the MCH department at Nakuru County Teaching and Referral Hospital. Nearly all the mothers and infants were on heart and pediatric ART regimen respectively. The prevalence of HIV among HIV exposed infants at f was at 4.5% for the first 24 months of their lives. At six weeks, more, more than 95% of the exposed infants were on prophylactic therapy and were exclusive breastfed. Exclusive breastfeeding predominated for the first nine months for most of the infants. Then exclusive breastfeeding at six months was determined to be an independent predictor of, uh, independent predictor of infant seroconversion. Thus, basing on this conclusion, we recommend that HIV gui guidelines need to be followed and hospitals need to increase and take care of their record keeping to avoid having missing details. And uh, these are our references. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Washira, for that uh, good presentation. So our next presenter is Amadi Rene. Um, he's currently working at an, as an intern at Checkup Medical Center. He has demonstrated strong leadership skills whilst uh, being a student at the School of Pharmacy by serving as KEPSA president, as well as um, being the Kabara rugby team captain. His research interests include pharmacovigilance and pharmacoepidemiology, and his presentation will be on content uniformity and in vitro dissolution of amlodipine half tablets. Please let us welcome Amadi. Hello, uh, I am Amadi Rene, and uh, I'll take you through this uh, research on uh, content uniformity and in vitro dissolution of amlodipine half tablets. Uh, I did this uh, project under the supervision of uh, Dr. Sarah Rugigi. Okay, yeah. So uh, there is a common practice that is uh, the tablet splitting method, and it is uh, most commonly practiced uh, in uh, pharmacies and hospitals for the benefits of. Uh, com uh, those flexibility, easier swallowing, and also cost saving effect. But uh, in, uh, during this practice, we do realize that there are some risks that we do uh, face ourselves uh, during, the, during this practice, and that includes a variation in the weight, content, and the integrity of the two splitting tablets that we do have. So uh, these uh, risks are, uh, are, uh, are contributed by uh, this, by, uh, three major factors. Eh? That's uh, patient factors. Uh, does the patient really know how to, uh, how to split this tablet? Uh, does the, do they have the skill, what at their age, and also the state of their consciousness uh, before they, they split? And also, it is also affected by the tablet factors, that is the tablet size, the shape, hardness, and also the presence of uh, yeah, the score line. Uh, the splitting method also affects uh, the results 
of uh, the split tablets that you'll be having. Yeah. So uh, the assumption is that, uh, okay, for this project, we did it using um, Lodipin 10MG. So while you are splitting these tablets, you do expect to have uh, the, two tab the two split tab tablets being 5MG and 5MG. But uh, the risk uh, uh, of this practice is you might result into damaging this tablet or maybe altering the distribution of, this, of the content while, uh, uh, while splitting it or maybe affecting the tablet integrity. So those are the, uh, the safety concerns uh, during these practices. Uh, the resultant two split tablets that you'll be having, they might be having a weight variation. That is uh, the two split tablets not being of the same weight or a content variation that is the API, the uh, active pharmaceutical ingredient not being the same for these two split tablets or maybe dosing inaccuracy. So while you'll be receiving, uh, while you'll be taking these tablets that have uh, that have undergone this risk, then the patient who is taking the, uh, the, the drug will be having an inconsistency during treatment. Okay, so uh, I did this study with the name of uh, having a better understanding of this practice, uh, that is the tablet splitting, and also its suitability. Then uh, uh, the other thing is also to under, uh, understand the accuracy of uh, this tablet splitting, especially for amlodipine, Tablets. As we all know, amlodipine is, uh, uh, is used in hypertension and it is a uh, calcium channel blocking. Uh, that's uh, the mode of action. And also, uh, I, I, I was doing this uh, study so as uh, to highlight the importance of employing good splitting techniques and also to utilize the information so that uh, for the healthcare workers and also the patients, they do know about the risks, the suitability, and importance of uh, this practice. So the objective was uh, to evaluate the effectiveness of the split of the uh, of this splitting techniques for amlodipine 10 mg. Then the, spe uh, the specific objectives being to determine the weight uniformity of the split portions and also to assess the content uniformity and also to and, uh, to carry out the in vitro dissolution test. So. Uh, what is, uh, for this test, uh, what is the weight variation? What will be the weight variation in uh, splitting amlodipine? Uh, what will be also the content uniformity and the effect of uh, splitting on dissolution of the split tablets? So I developed uh, this conceptual uh, framework where you get to understand that uh, for the effectiveness of uh, the splitting techniques, it all depends on the patient factors, uh, the tablet uh, splitting methods that you employ and also the uh, drug-related factors. Okay, though the drug-related factors, uh, there are many of them. So uh, while doing this test, I, I had to sample four brands of amlodipine 10MG. Then uh, the test that I did carry out uh, was, first I had to consider the average weight of the whole tablets before splitting, the average hardness before splitting, uh, the thic their thickness and diameters, because all these will affect uh, the outcome. Then uh, the next was uh, now to carry out the weight variation test for the, heart, uh, for the half tablets, of which uh, this one was done according to the European Pharmacopoeia. Uh, we had to sample 30 tablets, then split them into halves. Then uh, uh, we'll have from these two halves, only one half will be measured. Then we'll, uh, we will uh, then uh, uh, obtain the average of these uh, and use it for analysis. The acceptance criteria was according to the European Pharmacopoeia, uh, where uh, for, uh, for the tablets, uh, not, uh, not more than one tablet should have been uh, within the bracket of 85 to 115% of the average, uh, of its average, and also not more, uh, not more than one tablet should be in the bracket of uh, 75 to 125%. Then uh, the Third test we had to consider was the content uniformity test, which was also carried out according to the European Pharmacopoeia, where we had 10, tab 10 tablets uh, being selected from every brand. Then it will be split. We'll have a pool of 20 tablets. From the pool, we'll, all see, we'll, we'll only sample 10, 10 of them then uh, subjected to analysis using the UVVs, spectrometric uh, analysis, and uh, the absorbance being at 238 nanometers. So the acceptance criteria for this one was, uh, was also uh, 
not more than one tablet should be in the range of, uh, not no more than one tablet should be outside the range of 85 to 115% of the average uh, content, uh, or not more than one uh, of uh, the tablets should be outside the range of uh, 75 to 125% of uh, their average. Then uh, the last test we carried out uh, was the dissolution test. Uh, we had, we had 10 tab tablets being selected from every brand, then we'll split it and only obtain six tablets from the pool. Then uh, the, tab the six tablets will be subjected to the dissolution test, then uh, the subjected to spect uh, spectrometric analysis at an absorbance of 238 nanometers. Uh, this was according to the British Pharmacopoeia. So the results I, do, I did obtain was uh, for brand one, uh, brand one, brand two, brand three, you can see the range is about 93 to 99. And uh, all the tablets in this uh, case met uh, the acceptance criteria for the average weight of the test. Uh, yeah. Then uh, the next test was uh, average content of uh, amlodipine. Then uh, as you can see, uh, there's a difference in terms of uh, the, con the amlodipine uh, yeah, the highest being uh, 5.037 and uh, 5.520. Then for this test, only one of them failed, that was brand four. The last test was uh, the dissolution test, and you can also see there's a variation in uh, the amount of um, lodipine dissolved for these brands. Yeah? And uh, the one that failed was brand two. So these tests I did, uh, were carried out and for these four different brands, uh, that is the average weights of uh, the split tablets, the average contents of the amlodipine, and also uh, the uh, average amount of am amlodipine dissolved. As you have seen, uh, brand one and brand three uh, failed, uh, brand one and brand three ac uh, met the acceptance criteria, all of the three of them. Brand four uh, failed uh, the weight vary, ah, brand four, met the, uh, the criteria for weight variation and dissolution test, but failed the content uniformity test. Brand two uh, met all the uh, criteria except for dissolution test. So a uh, weight variation test, we were carrying it out uh, so as to see the, okay, these factors that did affect uh, the weight variation test because it was only just splitting the tablets and measuring their, their weight as it is. So uh, we, I did use uh, the standard deviation as a method of understanding the consistency in the getting uh, the, uh, the weight, the half, okay. The target is getting half the weight of the whole tablet. So uh, we need to have the consistency in this. So uh, we, I, that's why I was using the standard deviation so that I could see the consistency uh, for these tablets. Though, uh, as you can see, the highest standard deviation was obtained in brand four, that is eight, and brand one, seven, and the least was obtained in brand three, uh, which was four. Then this can be attributed to their tablet characteristics. As you can see, brand three, it had, a, it, it had an oblong shape, uh, then uh, it, it had a larger size, because uh, the large size is because of uh, the of, you can see the weight was 322.8 milligrams. That is the average of the whole tablet. Uh, while uh, we, uh, when you compare it to brand four and brand one, which had an uh, average weight of 172.2 milligrams and 162.2 milligrams, you'll see that uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, 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 the size really affected uh, the standard deviation. And also, this can be attributed by also the diameter. You can see there's a difference in diameter for brand three having 10.8 millimeters and uh, the other one, brand four and one, having 7.96 and 7.00 millimeters. Then also observe that brand three had a deeper score line. So the tablet char characteristics seemingly affected the variation for this test. The next one was a content uniformity test of which this one I was carrying it out just to demonstrate the amount that uh, the patient will get uh, after having this split. And for brand two, uh, all the tablets, uh, uh, all the tablets, 
the split tablets in this uh, brand, uh, that the, all the 10 tablets that we did have uh, were above the label claim. The label claim is five milligrams. Remember, we are splitting amlodipine um, 10 milligrams. So meaning that for this brand, we'll have 10 episodes of uh, uh, the patient having uh, the amlodipine um, content being more than the label claim because we want to have five milligrams being delivered, but now we are having more than five being delivered for 10 episodes. And even for the next 10 episodes, if the patient does take the drug, then you are expecting the, the patient to be having a delivery of less amount than the label claim. Then the best, the better, uh, a better result was uh, obtained for brand three because uh, of the consistency. Then you can also see the trend for, because for brand three, it, uh, it had a better size and a better shape. And also the, the consistency is still shown in this one. Brand 4 did not meet the acceptance criteria because we had two of the tablets being outside the limit of 85 to 115%, and also it had the highest standard de deviation. So there is no consistency in this one. Uh, hence, uh, it, it, uh, two tablets are also no, now outside the limit. And uh, from the first test, you can also, you can also remember it had uh, poor results. Eh? Then the last one was, uh, the last test I did carry out was a dissolution test. So a dissolution test was also a demonstration of now the amount that will dissolve, uh, the amount of amlodipine that will dissolve. And I said that uh, we carried it out according to the British Pharmacopoeia, where it had to meet the criteria uh, we just stopped at S1. So at S1, that is uh, the, tab the tablet should have and uh, should have not less than 80% of uh, the content, uh, of the amount being delivered. So this one we were using, remember we are splitting, amlodipine, 10 milligrams. So while you split it, you expect to get five milligrams and five milligrams. So for you to meet the 80% in this case was uh, five, uh, five, uh, 80% of five mg, that's four mg. Then, this one's, uh, for this one, it's brand two that didn't meet the criteria. And also remember brand two had a poor results in weight variation test. And uh, this can also be attributed by the tablet characteristics because now the size was 174, 174.8 uh, milligrams. This was uh, relatively lower compared to all the other three brands. Also the diameter was a bit low because for this one it's uh, eight millimeters, uh, while uh, if you compare it to, let's say, brand three, the diameter was 10.8 millimeters. So, uh, so the results were also affected by the relatively higher uh, tablet hardness, because for, higher, for harder tablets, it's not easy to, to split them. And also the tablet thickness. Uh, for, this, for, the thickness for thicker tablets, it's, you, uh, the, you, you do lose the precision and accuracy while splitting them. Then the best consistency for the dissolution test was seen in uh, brand three and brand four. So you can notice the consistency in these results for uh, brand three. And uh, for brand three, uh, it's, bec uh, it's because of uh, we, uh, the shape, the size, and also the diameter size, and also the uh, commendable uh, depth of the score line. So for these results, uh, for this test, only three of the uh, three out of the four uh, brands passed this test. So in conclusion, uh, we did this test. Uh, we had four brands of amlodipine, uh, 10 mg, being subjected to this test, and uh, the, we had three major tests. Uh, that was uh, the weight variation test, con uh, content uniformity test, and dissolution test. Uh, we are on, we only had, uh, we had brand two failing the dissolution test and brand four failing the content uniformity test. Then uh, one thing that you can notice is, is uh, the tablet characteristics really d does affect uh, the accuracy, the, uh, the precision accuracy, consistency, and performance of these split tablets. Yeah. So uh, for this, because these are very common practice in our settings, and also, for, uh, we were using, uh, we used amlodipine, but we know that many, many other tablets um, are being split. 
uh, especially the ones ma for managing chronic diseases. Uh, and uh, we, pose, we pose a danger in uh, having inconsistency control for, these, uh, for, the, for the patients who are, uh, who are undercarrying this, uh, ar this practice. So when uh, we do have uh, inconsistency uh, for controlling a condition, then uh, yeah, we are not really having the clinical management. So uh, the recommendation was uh, the healthcare providers and, uh, oh, and uh, patients should have enough education uh, on the potential risk associated with these techniques. And also the, the, regula uh, reg the regulatory agencies should also provide gu guidance on the development and ev evaluation of these tablets that are meant to be split. Though we, in a way, I, I, I would recommend that this practice should be discouraged. Then maybe if, uh, we can undercarry uh, future research to conduct and uh, to, con uh, to investigate the effect of splitting on uh, maybe bioavailability and pharmacokinetic properties of amlodipine or any other drug. Uh, these were the references. Thank you. Amadi, I think he deserves a better hand clap than that. So this practice of splitting tablets is quite rampant in clinical practice. Um, so dissemination of this research will help us find a solution to that problem. So our last uh, presentation today is from Cynthia Charlo who is a final year pharmacy student at the School of Pharmacy, uh, awaiting her graduation in December 2023. While not studying or practicing uh, pharmacy, she is a chess enthusiast, either playing, uh, arbitrating, or training chess. Perhaps she'll be the next Judith Polga, a Hungarian chess uh, a female Hungarian chess master. She also loves traveling. So her presentation will be on the virtual screening of anti-diabetic plant phytochemicals for analogs that cause beta cell regeneration. Let us welcome Cynthia. Hello, Cynthia. Hello. I hope you can hear us. Yeah? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, you can continue. Okay, thank you. So, good evening, everyone. My name is Chalo Cynthia. Now, imagine a world where diabetes is curable, where once a diagnosis is made, all we do is put a patient on medicines that regenerate their pancreatic beta cells. So then once the cells are all grown and developed, insulin production resumes, and the patient no longer needs to be on insulin or the oral hypoglycemics. So this research explores this uh, possibility. My co-authors are uh, Felix Otieno, Samuel Munene, and Dr. Richard Kagia. So our research topic, is in silico analysis of quercetin and genistein, zinc analogs that cause beta cell regeneration. On the background of the study, so diabetes is a chronic metabolic disease that is characterized by elevated blood sugar levels. Once uh, a diagnosis is made with repeated measurements of blood glucose levels, where the fasting blood glucose is either above 7.8 millimoles per liter or the random blood glucose is above 11.1 millimoles per liter, 
or the glycated hemoglobin is above 6.5 percent, or the oral glucose tolerance test is above 200 milligrams per dl after two hours. So once diabetes is uh, is diagnosed, it has been shown to have poor prog uh, poor prognosis in terms of recovery. In addition to that, it is associated with development of medical emergencies such as diabetic ketoacidosis, microvascular complications such as retinopathy, neuropathy, neuropathy, and nephropathy. It's also associated with microvascular complications such as stroke and kidney disease. And studies have reported that diabetes is immunosuppressive. Therefore, it increases incidences of infection in patients that are suffering from diabetes. So clearly from this background, we can see that uh, diabetes reduces the quality of life of patients. So in the epidemiology, if we talk numbers worldwide, it is postulated to reach 600 million cases by 2045. Uh, of all these cases, 85% is covered by type 2 diabetes mellitus, while for type 1, it takes around 10%. In Africa, approximately 24 million people are living with diabetes mellitus, and this is projected to shoot to 55 million by 2045. In Kenya, for every 100 people, four have diabetes mellitus, yet two out of, uh, two thirds of these are living with diabetes are undiagnosed. Therefore, this reminds us of how silent a, a pandemic diabetes is. So in the problem statement, currently diabetes is being managed by use of exogenous insulin to replace the diminished
did was that on the of the of the 40 analogs by
Repartition from the acro to the organic emission from Only the best analog. the CYP inhibition to make in the lab and 10 which is very difficult so i
that presentation. I would like us to clap for all our presenters. Yes, it's quite encouraging to see students interested um, in the field of research. Um, we'll now have our Q&A session. So if you had any questions for any of the presenters, you can ask them at this point. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, the first uh, question is to Dr. Suge. Which antihistamine specifically helped in combating antimicrobial resistance? I did not see it there. 